And I think you're all going to be glad you came today because God's going to help us see, I, I think, with new eyes what is happening in our country. And what you're about to hear is, is like the third revision of this message. I mean, it's not a revision, it's a total rewrite. I, I went at this uh, the first couple of times quoting all kinds of church leaders trying to give you the best overview I could of where I think we're, we're at right now. And, and then toward the end of the way, I came across something that just totally nailed it. And I, I could quote you church leaders from all denominations, all perspectives, who are basically going down the same line, saying the same things, but this is probably the broadest and best view uh, that pulls it all together. Some of you will recognize the man's name. It's John MacArthur. Uh, He's been a pastor for more than 40 years. He's written more than 150 books. Uh, He's a prolific writer, highly regarded as a Bible scholar, easily one of the most influential teachers of our time. And this is some of what he said at his church uh, a couple of weeks ago. He said, I just want you to know that what happens in the political world, what happens in the halls of temporal power in the United States of America or anywhere else, has absolutely nothing to do with the advancement of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of Christ does not rise or fall. It is not diverted or directed. It is not hindered, and it is not aided by anything going on in the temporal or temporary world. You have to understand that there are two kingdoms in the world. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And whatever is not a part of the kingdom of God is part of the kingdom of Satan to one degree or another. So we really don't expect compatibility between the two. I view the separation of church and state as a separation of the kingdom of God from the kingdom of Satan. And why would we want to partner with that? There are many verses in Scripture that affirm the future of the church. There are none that affirm the future of any political entity. The Lord Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And the Lord Jesus said, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. And whoever comes to me, I will not turn away, but I will receive And I will keep and I will raise on the last day. The Lord will build his church. Paul says God always causes us to triumph in Christ. So the triumph of the church is assured. The kingdom will go forward. The elect will be brought in. And the name of the Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ one day will be exalted. And then he continues. He said, having said all that, I also want to say that the Bible does not exalt democracy. The Bible does not advocate democracy. There is nothing about democracy on the pages of Scripture. It is simply a human mechanism that has been devised to provide freedom for people. It's really a reactionary form of government from those who have been abused under some kind of autocratic system. But the Bible doesn't advocate democracy. In fact, wise people understand that built into democracy is its own destruction. It was in 1790 that Alexander Tiddler, who was an Edinburgh professor of history and had studied the Greek cities and the Greek democracies, which is where we get our model of democracy. And remember when he said 1790, that's 1776, we formed America. So, uh, so he's, ri- he's a contemporary, he's writing about that time. And, uh, and he says that a democracy is a temporary form of government because as soon as the people discover they can vote themselves large amounts of money out of the public treasury, it collapses under the financial burden. And that is exactly what happens. And Tiddler says it is inevitable, apparently, in about a 200-year period. You give 200 years to any democracy, basically, And people will discover that they can get money by electing the people who will give them the money and not the rest of the people. And eventually the demands of the people who are the takers will overwhelm the abilities of the givers and the system will collapse. First it will collapse into debt. And he says, think 17 trillion and more. I mean, that's the the, the financial fiscal cliff we're on right now of unsustainable debt. We can't, there's no way this, this can be sustained. And he's quoting a guy who wrote this when our country was founded. Uh, the, uh, so th- 
um, how do I get back into this? And, and they will continue to elect the people who give them what they want until the entire thing collapses. And you can look at Europe and see what is the outcome of that. So there's nothing sacred about democracy. And I know that's a new thought for many of us who are brought up to believe it's, you know, American Jesus. But, but he, he goes on to say, what will happen, according to Titler, was democracy starts in a desire for freedom from bondage and ends up in bondage because eventually it sells its soul back to the government to get what it wants from the government and then the government takes ownership. Because freedom is defined as choices and the more choices you give to the government, the fewer choices you have and that's what defines your freedom and eventually they take all your freedom. So I wouldn't be surprised in the future if there are less and less and less freedoms that people in America enjoy. Right now, they're willing to make that exchange for two reasons. Get this. They're willing to make it, number one, for the sake of money in their pocket, and number two, for the sake of immorality. If the government will let them have free sex, homosexual marriage, abortion, no consequence, basically, is what he's saying, they're fine. They're okay with that. When you have a platform of a party to remove God, taking prayer out of our schools, out of our public debate, affirm free sex, government-provided contraception, removing the consequences of sex outside of marriage, homosexual marriage and abortion on demand, paid for by the government, that's where we're, we're at. When that's the platform, you know how far a nation has gone into immorality. And I would just add, you know, don't blame this on one person. Both parties' platforms changed. They morphed on this to accommodate the will of the people. That's where we are. So I want you to hear this. He says, I don't mind the darkness getting darker. I don't mind the illusion of morality going away. I don't mind the darker environment. In this, in this sense, that the darker the night, the brighter the light. But the church has to step up and be the church and proclaim the gospel and confront the culture. That's what we have to do. And when we do that, what's going to happen is persecution. Because they're already talking about hate speech and the categories of hate speech are going to escalate as the immoral country begins to try to defend itself and isolate itself and not face the reality of its immoral, immorality. In other words, we're going to be the ones accused of hate speech because we won't go along, because we won't say everything's okay. Because, so the church then has to become prophetic. We've got to drop the self-esteem stuff, the prosperity gospel, all the superficiality, all the feel-good things, that, and we have to step up and confront the culture. He said, sometimes people say to me, do you worry when you say certain things about abortion or homosexuality or immorality, when, these, when, when you bring up these, these issues, MacArthur said, the only thing I worry about is am I being faithful to God? Am I being faithful to the Word of God? Whatever happens in response to that is completely in the hands of God. But I do know this. Nothing good will happen unless sin is confronted and the gospel is proclaimed. So we're committed to that. I think persecution will come. And if it comes, it will purify the church. It always does. Because fake Christians will not be persecuted. <laughs> they won't stand for it. I mean, they'll give in. So they have a way of disappearing, and you're left with the true church. But the bottom line is Romans 1. Whew, this is, this is cr crucial here. Romans 1 says, if you do not retain God in your knowledge, if you do not glorify him, his wrath is unleashed. And it's talking about the cycle of history. Acts 14, God allows nations to go their own way, and we're going our own way right now. We're, we're going the way of our own choices, and when the wrath of God is in motion, God gives them over. That's what Paul says. This is his wrath in motion. He gives them over to sexual sin. That's what we got. Sexual sin is rampant. Over 50% of adult men and women are single. The kind of lifestyle with its promiscuous kind of behavior everywhere is what this generation wants. But that's an evidence of wrath, the smashing and crushing of the family. And then the next one, verse 26, Paul goes on. He's, he's reading through Romans 1 here. He gave them over to homosexuality. And now we're not only tolerant of it, we're advocates of that. And then 
he gave them over to a reprobate mind. And that includes murder, all kinds of other crimes, which would include abortion. Over 70 million infants in the safe place of their mother's bodies are slaughtered. America is number two among the nations of the world in the number of abortions performed so that we can have convenient sex and no consequences. MacArthur concludes with this. He said, Romans 1 ends by saying, they know the judgment of God because it's written in Scripture, but they not only do it, but they give hearty approval to those who do it. They elect the people who advocate this stuff. That's the evidence of divine judgment. So know this, this nation's under judgment. Whatever might have been in the past, God has always judged individual and personal sin, but eventually in a people, it accumulates to the point where God abandons the nation. And I think there's going to be even less and less restraint in the future as God pulls back and lets the nation go to the consequence of its own choices. Now, that's not the end of the story because that's only Romans 1. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes so the answer to the issue is the preaching of the gospel of Christ all right so I, I blew through that that's a lot to wrap your head around and I'm laying in bed Friday morning I guess yeah Friday morning 5 30 I'm wide awake and I'm thinking how in the world God do we get a handle on this and this is what came to me I'm texting this into my phone so that I'd remember it and uh, let me try to restate what I just said real simply the democratic experiment which is what we are what we have here in this country it's the basis of our Constitution that experiment was only set to work as long as we the people are willing to see ourselves as one nation under God yeah that's it. Who will sacrifice our personal freedoms for the common good. Well, that all changed. That isn't happening anymore. Our TVs and movies reflect this total disdain for God, this move toward secularism, this disregard for God, for His laws. They just look so silly to us now. Our culture is immersed in a secular worldview that's mostly about me and my rights. Am I accurate on that? I mean, it's just about me. It's not about you. And democracy breaks down under that. You can't have democracy under that. But the worst part, and, and this is what you got to back up to, the worst part is, is that when we collectively won't acknowledge our Creator as having the right to lead us and call the shots, the Bible says He gives us up to ourselves. And that is a very, very bad thing because as we've looked at in Scripture, the human heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. And we do not want God giving us up to ourselves because we do bad things to each other when we're running, the, calling the shots. So, uh, you know, that's all God has to do to judge us. That's all God has to do to bring wrath on us. Just stop disciplining us. We don't want him to stop disciplining us. When God stops disciplining you, you're in trouble. The writer of Hebrews says he disciplines those whom he loves. So when, you know, when, God's, judging, when God's disciplining you heavily, you, you need to be going, thank you, thank you that you love me and you're not just letting me go my own way. Because once he gives us up, then it's this downward spiral Paul describes in Romans 1. And that is not going to change with another election. So we need to give it up, guys. We need to stop thinking that's going to change it. This, this requires change at the heart level. That's where prayer comes in. You know, I've been telling you we need to become a praying church. We've got to become. This is not hopeless, but politics are not going to change things. We're beyond that. It's the church being the church. It's us being the light, praying the prayers of Scripture, asking for the spirit of prayer to fall on us. It can change things. It, the Great Awakening uh, study that in history and what it did in our country. I mean, it can, it can change things. We'll go into a little bit of that maybe next more, uh, next week uh, uh, some more. But, but uh, that's why we've got to stay on this trajectory we're on. Okay, so here we are. <laughs> After a week of wondering if the Middle East was going to implode, take us into the 
World War III, we're barreling toward a fiscal cliff that's unsustainable. It seems like it's just one natural disaster after another. And now we come to church and our wonderful pastor tells us the judgment of God has come down on America. You know, seriously, Ron? I mean, really? I know some of you are thinking that. All right, here's, here's what we're going to focus on today. Here's where we're going with this. We're not going to stay in the ditch. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, starting verse 18. It says, but the path of the just, the path of the righteous is the way some translations say, say it. That's the way I memorize it. Is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter, brighter and brighter unto the full day or perfect day, as this says. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Now, I want us to leave here with a couple of things today. Very, very clear in our thinking. First, yes, the darkness is getting darker. I want us awake. I don't want us, you know, in la-la land thinking that everything's okay. It's not okay. But even more, I want us to know the, the light is getting brighter. God is waking us up. God has been speaking to our hearts. He has been talking to us. He has been warming up our hearts. And as his children, if we'll stay on that track, that track that he's leading us into, we are headed out into noonday sunshine. It's going to get really bright. I mean, God's going to be with us. And second, through it all, God is present. He hasn't abandoned us. As the world continues to disintegrate, God is going to protect us. He is going to provide for his people. That's all over scripture. Even the stragglers who have a heart to follow are going to experience God. So here's something that I read also on, on MacArthur's blog. He said, one of the most hopeless aspects of unrepentant sinners' lives is that they have no answer for anxiety. They're forced to put their hopes in flimsy, fallible plans and institutions. They aren't able to rest firmly in the unchanging promises of God. They have to ride out every wave of calamity, every unexpected disaster. Not so with God's kids. Our personal relationship with God is the only answer to staying out of fear and anxiety. And that is why we've been drawing close. That's why we've been just setting our hearts before God and worship. I've been teaching about having a, a revelation of the Father's love for you because thanks to Jesus, we know who he is. We're not in the dark. He gave us very clear word pictures of exactly what our Heavenly Father's like and how he feels about it. Here in Matthew 7, 9, Jesus said, What man is there among you? When his son asks for a loaf, for a loaf of bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you'll not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, read it with me, give what is good to those who ask him? God controls everything. He owns it all, and he loves you way more than the very best parent in the world loves their child, meaning you can be certain that he is going to provide for you, that he is going to take care of you. we are talking about supernatural Christianity. God wants you to know what that's like. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us an example we can all understand. This is Matthew 6, 26. He said, look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? seen a bird sitting in a tree, fluttering, shaking, squawking, you know, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to feed my kids? It's global warming out here. Oh, God gives birds an instinct for survival. He not only creates life, he nourishes it. Psalm 147.9 says he feeds the young ravens when they cry. That's a gnarly bird. Did you ever see a raven? And yet God feeds them. God feeds them. Jesus said, even, even though birds don't sow or reap or stockpile gold or silver, their heavenly Father hears their cry and provides for them. But it's not like 
They just sit there and wait for worms to rain out of the sky. God equipped them with bug and worm radar. I had a window out my office, and man, they are on the ground. They are looking. They are listening. They are hunting. They are, you know, pecking for breakfast. He quips. They work. They're not busy worrying. They're busy searching, gobbling, feathering their nests, feeding their babies, nudging them, nudging them forward, teaching them to fly, moving on with the seasons. That's God's design at work. So Jesus says, oh, you a little faith. Why are you worrying? You've got a heavenly father too. Over and over, Jesus would come out with, fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Matthew uh, 10, 29, Jesus says, what is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin. But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. <laughs> See, here's the deal. God didn't create birds in his own image. Sparrows aren't joint heirs with Jesus Christ like the Bible says we are. And yet we get this picture from Jesus of God caring for him with tender love. Because he wants us to see how we can trust in his tender care for us. He wants us to look at his creation and go, oh, oh, I have a heavenly father who takes care of me. God puts these kind of lessons around us in creation to help us see how he creates uh, and, and we work in partnership with him. And there's joy in living when we're doing that, when we're in that partnership. Here's another beautiful word picture, Matthew 23, 37, Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. I think that's what God's saying to America right now. You know, I want to protect you. I want to help you. Don't, don't do this. Don't go this direction. It's another picture, though, of God's desire to protect us, to love us. Look at, look at these little baby birds here. I mean, how cute is that? I mean, that's a picture of the Father's heart for you. Like a, you know, photo text message saying, stop, think about that, think about that. I think this last one's more about the kindness of strangers, you know, there. But uh, Listen to David's prayer here in Psalm 1780. He said, oh, Lord, hide me under the shadow of your wings. Psalm 36, 7, how precious is your unfailing love, O oh God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 57, 1, have mercy on me, God. Have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I think, you know, David has this shepherding, you know, years as a young man where he gets this indelible picture of God's love and protection that he sees reflected in creation. And it goes with him the rest of his life. I mean, he keeps going back to that. The one I meditated on was the one that helped me overcome my fear of flying. I had a deathly fear of flying. I left finger marks on airplanes seats. I mean, I, I literally would hold myself off the ground. It was irrational. I told myself it was irrational, but I felt like if I could hold myself up, the plane would be lighter. I don't know what that was all about. And literally, I'd get on the plane and start sweating. And so I would take Psalm 91. This is, you know, a, the psalm. I memorized it in King James English. And this is what I'd read to myself. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the, for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. And they shall 
keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, a real danger in David's day. Young lion and dragon, thou shalt trample under feet. Now get this, because this whole thing flips. Now it's God talking. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him, show him my salvation. Whew. You talk about a, a good thing to be reading when you're terrorized at 30,000 feet. Man, that's a good one. God really does love you that much. He really wants to provide for you. He really wants to protect you. He wants you to believe it. Most of us are so caught in fear right now, those words sound like fantasy to us. You know, we look at what's happening and around us, we get more and more anxious, the darkness scares us, so what do we do? You do what I did on every plane flight. Now, I had that memorized as a young man, but I would take my Bible, and I had it all, <laughs> my Bible just would fall open to Psalm 91. And I'd lay it on my lap, and most of it was underlined, and I'd read those words again and again and again, I just allowing the Holy Spirit to make it real, to settle my heart. And eventually, my heart would start to settle down. And then we'd hit an air pocket, and I was right back to Psalm 91. <laughs> you know, I grew up hearing a lot of stuff about antichrist and persecution and tribulation, the book of Revelation. And as a kid, it used to scare me to death. I hated apocalyptic talk. And, uh, and as I got older, you know, I just, I, you know, I looked at the situation and thought, this isn't going to happen in the foreseeable future. We're, we're, this is, there's no way in America. America's God's country, you know. There's no way we can go down the tubes in a, morally in a generation or two. It's going to take years, you know. I'll be dead and gone. And, and suddenly, we have this thing. We got one of these. Most, almost every one of us has one of these now. Even some of you... You know, guys that are older than me. And it's got GPS. It's got YouTube, TV, video, Facebooking, texting, Netflix, 24-7 news commentary, high-def video games in stereo. And it's all playing on a little device in my hand that I can take with me everywhere. I was driving down the California highway, and I could, stay, I could have stayed on the road just watching my screen and having Siri tell me what to do, which is the little voice inside my, my phone. I, I could have absolutely stayed on the run. Now, I didn't do that, and you young people don't ever do that. <laughs> don't ever text and drive. But, you know, all that to say, technology has taken us to the point of just total immersion. I mean, we, we, we are at its mercy, never away from it. Kyle, my son, I was telling me the other day, he said, I had to literally, I got... Confused, I had to turn Siri off to figure out where I was. I, I, you know, it be, we become totally dependent. We don't even think. So here we are, fascinated by this little thing. It just keeps getting cooler and sleeker. Look at how sleek it is. I can just stick it in my shirt pie. Oh, it's just so awesome. And suddenly, we're no longer in control of what we think or what we believe because we don't have time to think. The media is defining what we think. Our, vo our morals, our values, our beliefs. And if you don't believe that, that's that extreme, look at the polls. Even my generation has totally flipped on what we used to think was important. We used to think was bottom line. The Bible says the only way to stop the progress, the only way to fight the fear this is producing in us is with faith. And faith only comes from one source. I want you to read it with me right here in Romans 10, 17. Ready? So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Same way fear comes, by hearing the words of gloom and doom, and it's going to be bad. So if you're going to have faith, you have to turn some things off, or at least use these devices wisely by tuning in to the right channel. You know, did you know your phone will read you Psalm 91? YouTube, uh, no, you version, Bible Gateway. There's several uh, uh, 
www.bible.org.com places that you can go to and get the Bible. And it'll read you variant translations, the whole Bible, any part of it. You can, uh, you can use your phone uh, to, to play worship music. You can use your phone to listen to one of our podcasts, one of my podcasts on- online. Or, or download it and listen to it on the way to work. I read about a pastor who challenged uh, his 20-something to turn off his devices for 24 hours. He said, you, you are an addict, and, uh, and he said, I, and this will prove it. 24 hours. It almost killed the guy. I mean, he, he's telling the story. He said, I couldn't check my email in the morning. I could text my wife that I was sitting in a restaurant waiting for. Her. He said, I almost went into panic. I was freaking out that she wouldn't find a place or be there on time. He said, we usually text 17 times, you know, on the way to a place. And, and I'm looking around, and, and I see all these other couples, and their eyes are glued to their phones. And I had to sit there in awkward silence. And then he had to actually pick up a newspaper and try to navigate that bulky thing, you know, and figure out what the news was. And, and then he gets home, and he couldn't watch TV. He couldn't check the web. He couldn't even read a book because all his books were now on his phone. <laughs> we're addicts. We're addicts. When there's silence, we panic. We don't know what to do with ourselves. And if we are not willing to face that down and confront it, it's eventually going to control us, if it isn't already. Turn some stuff off. Don't watch the news incessantly. Your body and mind can't absorb global information 24-7, especially when it's aimed at sensationalizing it. It's not just news, it's entertainment. If you're you're going to stay sane, you you have got to get that. You're going to send yourself over the cliff. You're going to be dealing with panic disorder and all the ailments that go along with that. If you want to know what's happening, find a website where you can get the headlines and then just turn it off. You can, you know what? You can read the headlines in 10, 15 seconds and then just turn it off. Because if you go to the articles, the articles are going to, oh, and you can watch this video. Oh, and look at, look at the bomb. Look what it was like. And you can't do that. Anything more than just, you know, a few seconds, just getting the news is just feeding fear. And then intentionally, intentionally feed your faith. Read and memorize verses like I just read you, passages. Uh, Psalm 91 is an awesome one. Maybe just pick out one verse or phrase or word for the day, you know, that you're, you're going to meditate on. I, the, one of my favorites in that passage is, God, you are my refuge. You are my refuge. I run to you, God. You are my refuge. I trust you, God. You are a safe place for me. When fear is raining down on my head and my ch- chest in the middle of the night suffocating me. And listen, I know what that's like. You know what happened to me this morning? Dead. Weirdly. Probably about 4 o'clock. I didn't look at the clock. I've gotten past that. I Because that just adds to it. Oh, no. Now I'm not going to be able to go back to sleep. You know, it's just like that ridiculous thing. So I just lay there. And, and, and sometimes when that gets severe, all I can say is Jesus. 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 I try to say it with my breathing sometimes. Let me tell you, that works. It doesn't matter if you've got a phobia or anxiety that's plagued you for 10 years or, or you're feeling just this generalized sense of impending doom right now. Help me, Jesus. Again and again and again. Sometimes say it to yourself a thousand times a day and start over the next day. The devil will back off. The devil, because the Bible says in Philippians 2, 9, there is power in the name of Jesus. Look at this. God has highly exalted him and given him the name, read it with me, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, every demon And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name of Jesus is powerful. It is powerful. It's not some mantra you're, you're quoting. This is the name that God has exalted above every name. This isn't rocket science. God has made his power available to every one of us. Yeah, it's getting darker, but the light's getting brighter. God's moving toward us. He is not indifferent. He is not dispassionate. He is passionate about us. So keep moving toward the light. 
you know, talking to him, quoting his word to him, saying his name to him, which is what we're doing every time we're, we're, we're praying these fellowship and trust prayers. We're praying the word of God. He made it simple. Look at the bird. Look at her babies. You know, see the way this whole thing has been set up. He's with us. He's going to take care of us. He's going to provide for us. And if you've accepted the gift of forgiveness through Jesus, he's not just with you. He's actually in you. He's dwelling in you. So he is going to protect you. He's going to be with you every step of the way. This is a good fight we're in. Paul says that, calls it that. He calls it the good fight of faith in 1 Timothy 6, 12. Because it's a fight we win every time. If you curl up in a ball, you hide in a closet, you know, your face is going to shrivel up like your Grinch heart. You know, you don't want that. This Christmas is going to be a dark, dark time for you. But we don't have to cower. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.7, Let's read this. I love this. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now, Paul says it fight, faith is a fight because there is an enemy. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does that through fear. Through fear. Here's how you activate the power of what Paul said there in the Bible. You speak it to the Holy Spirit who the Bible says is living in your spirit. You say, thank you for power and love and a sound mind, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are in me. Your word says you are power to me. You are love. You are soundness and balance, uh, uh, peace in my mind today. And you just repeat it to yourself. You say it to yourself throughout the day. Eventually, that new thought will replace the fear with faith. As the Holy Spirit begins to make it real. That's how revelation comes. You know, we've, we're, we've been praying, revelation, Holy Spirit. Bring revelation to my heart. Well, you've got to have the word in your heart for him to reveal. Get the connection? You can't just say revelation. He's going, well, give me something to reveal. Put it in your mind. Put it in your heart. Confess it to me. Say it to me. Speak it again and again, and I'm going to blow it up and show you how big and real this all is. And I'm telling you, it'll start to come alive. Now, it won't happen overnight, little at a time, breath at a time. The only thing that's stronger than fear is faith. And you'll either live in one of those or the other. So when fear comes knocking, you say, no, 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 not going there, not taking it, not swallowing it. You know what I did at 4 o'clock this morning? I just went into the trust prayer. Ah, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for your bright presence in me. I tell you, the devil will leave you alone if he knows you're going down that line. It's, it's amazing to me how the, oh, 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 oops, sorry, didn't mean to wake you up. <laughs> Don't go into praying that stuff. Don't go into asking God to do big stuff in your life. If the enemy sees consistently that you're just going to go at the word every time he comes at you, if he sees that you're just going to turn fear into prayer, he's going to back off. He's not an idiot. I mean, he knows what, he gets it. You know, stay away from him. Every time we torture him, he just ends up torturing us. Only thing stronger than fear is faith. You'll either live in one or the other. So when fear comes knocking, you say, no. No. First John says fear is torment. Perfect love of God casts out fear. Everything we need to rest in God, everything we need to resist our enemy, everything we need to overcome him is there for us in the word of God. Faith is the way we reach out and receive it one day at a time, one breath at a time. The Holy Spirit stands ready to reveal it, to activate its power. The devil wants you afraid of what's going down right now. He wants you trembling. He wants you behind closed doors, out of commission, away from the very people God has called you to reach out to. Let me tell you guys the doors are about to come unlocked to people's hearts. We have never seen a time where people are going to be more open to the gospel and to you sharing your story than, than what is about to happen. And to not give in and succumb to all the fear, we're going to have to get up, confess the truth, move out, obey God, feeling all kinds of afraid. You know, did you know the Bible never tells us not to feel afraid? It tells us to not be afraid. There's, there's a big difference. You can move forward with confidence in God with your knees knocking, with your heart fluttering. 
You can, and, and every time you do, every time you just go, okay, God, I'm going to step out in this. I'm going to trust you in, with feeling fear, but trusting you. That's faith. <laughs> That's what faith. And every time you do, a little more of the fear goes, a little more confidence in God gets built into your heart. Now, that's where we're going. This is kind of the intro to where I wanted to go. <laughs> but I think God has taken us to this place. So, you know, be back here next weekend because we're going we're gonna to kind of go this direction, talk about where I believe God wants us and is positioning us as a church.